In the last video, we looked at bivectors, which we currently think of as oriented plane segments. But what can we do with bivectors? In this video, we will explore some of the basic operations we can do on bivectors. This video is a part of From Zero to Geo, a series where we formulate geometric algebra, an incredibly powerful branch of mathematics, from the ground up. The first operations on bivectors that we will look at should be pretty simple. Remember that with vectors, we can find their magnitude and scale them. We can do the same things with bivectors. We can find their magnitude, which is just the area, and we can also scale them, which produces another bivector with the same orientation but a different area. Like with vectors, we can also scale bivectors by a negative number, which will change the magnitude of the bivector while also flipping its orientation. Note that I'm using the same notation for bivectors as I did for vectors. We write the magnitude of a bivector the same way that we write the absolute value, and we write scaling a bivector the same way as multiplication. These operations should be pretty simple, but there is one issue when it comes to scaling bivectors that you need to be aware of. Looking at the side length of these two bivectors, you might notice that the side length of the scaled bivector is not twice the side length of the original bivector. This is because area scales with the square of distance. If we had doubled the length of each side, the area would actually be multiplied by 4, since we can fit 4 copies of the original bivector inside. When scaling bivectors, we only care about the area, not the length of the sides. Thus, to scale the bivector by 2, you have to multiply each side length by the square root of 2. If you wanted to be sneaky, you could also just scale it in one direction by 2, although this doesn't scale the shape of the bivector, so it might feel a little weird, even though it is valid. Let's do some exercises involving these operations. Here are several bivectors. First, please find the magnitude of each bivector. This exercise shouldn't be too difficult since it's just some basic geometry. B1 is represented by a square of side length 1, so the magnitude of B1 is 1. B2 is represented by a parallelogram with a base length of 1 and a height of 2, so the magnitude of B2 is 2. B3 is represented by a parallelogram with a base length of 2 and a height of 2, so the magnitude of B3 is 4, and B4 is represented by a triangle with a base length of 2 and a height of 2, so the magnitude of B4 is 2. Next, please find each of these scaled bivectors. Before you pause the video, I would like to mention that there are many valid ways to draw the answers to this exercise. Remember, bivectors only care about their orientation and magnitude, and the exact shape of the bivector doesn't matter at all. Thus, don't worry if the shape that you get after scaling the bivector isn't the same as the shape I'm about to show here. As long as the orientation and magnitude are the same, your answer is correct. Anyway, please pause the video and solve this before continuing. For this first one, remember that area scales with the square of distance. Since we want to scale B1 by 4, we can do this by just scaling the side lengths of the square by 2. This produces 4 times B1. For the second one, if we wanted to scale the whole object equally, we would have to multiply the side lengths by the square root of 2, which is annoying. Instead, I'll just double one of the side lengths to produce 2 times b2. For the third one, we can do the inverse of what we did in the first one. To scale the whole bivector by 1 fourth, we can scale the side lengths by 1 half. This produces 1 fourth times b3. For the final one, we need to cut the magnitude in half, but since we are scaling by a negative number, we also need to flip the orientation. To cut the magnitude in half, I'll just cut the height of the triangle in half. Then we just need to flip the orientation. This produces negative 1 half times b4. The next bivector operation I want to look at is addition. Adding bivectors can actually get pretty complicated, but it's much simpler in two dimensions, so let's start there. If we have two bivectors with the same orientation, we can define addition to simply be adding the magnitudes, which can conveniently be done geometrically by just sticking the bivectors together. This process will work for any two bivectors that have the same orientation. But what about bivectors with opposite orientations? Well, it makes sense to me to subtract the magnitudes in this case, which can be done geometrically by putting one bivector over the other and then removing any spots that overlap. Using these rules, we can add any two bivectors in two dimensions. Before we move on, I want to point something out with bivector addition. Notice that when lining up two bivectors to add them, the adjacent sides are pointing in opposite directions. 
This happens when adding bivectors with opposite orientation too. Even though this isn't really what's going on, you can think of it as if the two sides are canceling each other. This observation will be important when looking at the addition of three-dimensional bivectors, so keep it in mind. Let's do an exercise. Here are several bivectors. Please find the following sums. Remember, the exact shape of your answers doesn't really matter. The important thing is that the magnitude and orientation of your answers are the same as the answers I'm showing here. Please pause the video and solve this before continuing. The first one should be pretty simple. They both have the same orientation, so we can just stick the two bivectors together to produce a counterclockwise bivector with a magnitude of 5. The next one is pretty similar, although it's easier in this case to stick the bivectors together vertically rather than horizontally, creating a counterclockwise bivector with a magnitude of 9. For the third one, these bivectors have opposite orientations, so we need to put one on top of the other and remove the overlap, creating a counterclockwise bivector with a magnitude of 4. The next one involves two bivectors with the same orientation, so we can stick them together again to produce a clockwise bivector with a magnitude of 6. The last one involves two bivectors with opposite orientations, and adding them produces a counterclockwise bivector with a magnitude of 2. Now that we've looked at two dimensional addition, let's look at three dimensional addition. We want to find a way to add two bivectors in three dimensional space that is consistent with the way we have been adding bivectors in two dimensional space. I want to cover two ways of thinking about this, one that is more qualitative and one that is more quantitative. For the qualitative way, let's go back to thinking about vector addition. While we have usually been describing vector addition using the tip to tail method, we can describe it in a more qualitative way as well. We can instead think of the sum as a mixture of sorts of the summands, with the sum looking more like one of the summands the higher that summands magnitude is. While this doesn't tell us exactly what vector the sum is, it can give us a general idea of what's going on when adding. We can do the same thing with bivectors. Even if we don't know exactly how to add bivectors, we can think of a bivector sum as being a mix of the two summands, with it being more like one of the summands the higher that summands magnitude is. Looking at this picture, you might notice that it looks pretty similar to the previous picture with vectors. This suggests that we can use this idea to add bivectors geometrically in a way similar to vectors, which leads us to the quantitative way of adding bivectors. Let's say we have two bivectors in 3D space and want to add them. Like with vectors, we can take one bivector and put it on the end of the other one, and then draw a third bivector going from the start of one bivector to the end of the other, which is their sum. But wait, which side of the bivectors is the start and which is the end? Why wouldn't we add these bivectors by putting this one over here and doing the same process, producing a different bivector? To answer this, remember how earlier in the video I said that when adding bivectors, you want the arrows at the point the two bivectors meet to be facing opposite directions. Here, notice that these two arrows are pointing in the same direction. Thus, adding the bivectors this way is invalid. If we move the bivector over here, the two arrows are pointing in opposite directions, so it is valid to add the bivectors this way. Another question you may have is what the orientation of the sum will be. This isn't too hard to answer. We can just use the orientation of the arrows on the sides of the summands that are also in the sum. Now, you might be wondering, what about bivectors that don't have a side you can align like this? No matter how you shift these bivectors around, you can't line up a side to do the sum. However, remember that we can change the shape of a bivector as long as we don't change its magnitude or orientation. We can change the shape of this bivector to line up their edges, at which point we can do the sum. But how exactly do we do this process? Well, given two arbitrary bivectors, we can look at the planes they live in. Every pair of non-parallel planes in 3D space intersect in a line, so we can just align the bivectors to this line and add that way. You might notice that I said that every pair of non-parallel planes intersect in 3D space. What about higher dimensions? Well, adding bivectors in higher dimensional space gets more complicated, so I don't want to look at that quite yet. We'll look at that topic in a couple of videos. Now, there are a couple of pitfalls you have to avoid when adding bivectors like this. First, when lining up bivectors, you need to ensure that the sides you are aligning have the same length. If this is not the case, you need to change the shape of one of the bivectors to ensure that this is the case before you can add. The second pitfall is that you can only use this to add bivectors when you are representing them as parallelograms. If one of your bivectors is represented by some random shape, 
you can't really get a plane segment from this process. In these cases, you need to transform that bivector into a parallelogram before you can add. Oh, and one more thing. Throughout this whole section of the video, for the sake of simplicity, I have been using rectangular bivectors at right angles. However, you can do the same process for arbitrary parallelograms at arbitrary angles. You just connect the parallelograms on one edge and then find the parallelogram going from one edge to the other. Now, this is the point that I would normally give an exercise asking you to add 3D bivectors, but just like in the last video, I don't really want to ask you to do this because doing 3D geometry is hard without some algebraic tools that we haven't yet developed. After the next video, we will start to get some of those algebraic tools, and I'll start giving more exercises involving 3D bivectors. At this point, you may have noticed something. The operations I defined for bivectors in this video are the same operations that we have for vectors. This leads to a natural question. Do bivectors form a linear space? We will answer that question in the next video.